Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. We got a pretty short video for you today. I'm going to take the Retroid Pocket 2 and I'm going to put a Retroid Pocket 2 Plus PCB inside of it. Now they sell a PCB upgrade kit on their website for about $65 plus shipping. And so when I bought my Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, I also bought one of those PCB upgrade kits so I could make a guide on it. And at the same time, they happen to have a sale on one of their fantastic colors. This one's called the Grape One. And these are modeled after the old Nintendo 64 models. I never really owned a Nintendo 64 back in the day, but it's kind of cool to have a little piece of it today. And so in this video, we're gonna take that PCB upgrade kit, put it inside this shell, and I'll walk you through the whole process. Now, one of the cool things about that PCB upgrade kit is that it allows you to take your old PCB and then they have this little acrylic case thing here and you basically turn it into a standalone console. And obviously this is something you'd have to plug into a TV to get to work. But this I'm going to put in a separate video. I want to keep these a little bit short. And so because of that, we'll just focus on the PCB upgrade today in this video. And if you've ever watched a hardware mod video from me, I like to take my time. I think it's a good time to kind of relax and walk through all the different steps. So kick back grab a drink, and let's get to it. Okay, so the kit actually comes with a couple tools of its own, but I really recommend this kit from iFixit. And I'll leave it linked in the video description below, but I got this about a year ago or so, and it's been really awesome. Like I've used this every single time I've done any sort of hardware mods on any device. And I'm not getting paid by them or anything else like that, I just really do like it. Now if you choose to swap out your screen with a touchscreen for the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, then you also are going to need to have a hairdryer. Now I'm pretty sure it does not need to be a Hello Kitty hairdryer, but if you do have one, I think that would definitely be the best. Anyway, you're also going to need an old Retroid Pocket 2. And like I mentioned before, I got lucky and got one of these fantastic colors. Hopefully they'll have these for sale soon on their website again, but either way, this is the one that I'm going to work with here. Now in your kit, it's going to come with the PCB itself, as well as some buttons. Now yours is going to come with black buttons. These colored buttons came from a review unit that I tested out a couple weeks ago. And these buttons were a little bit too big for its case, and so I swapped them out for the black ones. And we'll have to deal with that extra size here in this video. In addition, your kit will come with a couple different tools. For example, some plastic tweezers, some spacers that we'll use when we make a standalone Retroid Pocket 2 acrylic case, a Wi-Fi antenna for that same case, as well as a power cable. You'll also get this really small screwdriver and a couple generic guitar picks. And these here are the acrylic case pieces that will come with your PCB upgrade kit. And also, if you want to spend an additional $20, they'll send you a touchscreen as well. Now this really does help with the functionality of the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, so I do recommend this too. And one last thing that I forgot, this is a power board here. We'll use this also in that acrylic case video that I'll do next. So now that we have an idea of all the parts, let's actually take this thing apart and start swapping things out. First thing we need to do is remove these rubber bumpers and the screws inside. Now I also recommend using a deck of playing cards or something around the same size, so that way when you put the device down, it doesn't damage the screen and it sits nice and flush. Now I'm going to use the tweezers from my tech toolkit because these are nice and small and easy to grab things. The plastic tweezers that come with the kit just don't really get in there very well. And so because of that, I'll use my metal ones here and I'll just kind of pinch it on each side and then poke a little bit and then pull them right out. It's okay if you poke a little hole in the rubber things because they're kind of self-healing. Anyway, I tried their little screwdriver for a couple screws and I realized I hated it. So I went back to my tech tool kit and I used the screwdriver in there instead. Now, once you have those four screws out, it's time to take the case apart. And this is pretty easy, we're just going to take one of those guitar picks and slide it around the shoulder buttons and hit the little clips that are on each side. There's two clips per side. And all you really have to do is just run the plastic across them and it's going to snap them open. This is another part where you want to be pretty careful, because if you push down too hard it'll actually crack the clips and then it's going to be broken. So I recommend just doing it fairly gently and do it one side at a time. And each time these open up, it's a pretty satisfying click. Okay, so once we have everything unclipped, now it's time to remove the battery cable here. And this is pretty easy too, you just grab the little fastener that's at the end of it, and then you just kind of wiggle it out. Now there's a screw that's right here in front of it, and so you do have to take a little bit of time to wiggle it out, and you could even take the screw out first if it makes it easier on you. Anyway, we're now done with the back, we're not really going to mess with it at all. So first thing you want to do is remove the speakers here on the bottom, and these are pretty easy too, they have the same style of plastic clip. You just want to pinch and pull those out. And the speakers themselves are not held in by glue or anything else like that, they're really just kind of set in there. So it's just a matter of unclipping them and then using something plastic to just kind of pull them out. 
Either way, it just takes a little bit of leverage because these aren't glued in. Okay, next we want to remove some of the ribbon cables, and these are a little bit delicate, so take your time with these too. First, we'll remove the analog ribbon cable. This is just a matter of unclipping it and then pulling the cable out very gently. Next, we can do the display ribbon cable here. Same thing here, we're going to flip that clip up, and then we're just going to gently pull out that ribbon. Next, let's remove the shoulder and trigger button assemblies. And these will come apart in probably one or two pieces. The shoulder buttons might not connect to the triggers. Next, we'll remove the Wi-Fi antenna. And then if you still have an SD card inside your unit, I recommend taking that out as well. Next, we're going to remove these screws that are holding the PCB in. There are five of them all together. The one on the bottom right is kind of hard to find. After that, you can just pull out the PCB. It shouldn't be connected to anything at this point. Now we can go ahead and set this one aside. We're not going to need it until the next video. Also, when you pull out that PCB board, it's going to pop off that little right analog digital slider thing or whatever, and so just make sure you grab that top as well. My kit came with a new analog slider, so you may not need this one at all. Okay, next let's remove the old buttons and membranes. These are pretty easy to remove as well. They're not tied in by any sort of adhesive, you just need to pull them out one at a time. On top of that, you can pull out the home start and select buttons on the bottom. Personally, I recommend keeping the power and volume buttons on top in place because they're pretty secure up there, it's not worth messing with. And for the left analog stick, you just have to pop this one out as well. Now this screen is unique because it has plastic across the entire back of it, so it's kind of hard to get out. Now it has tape in this E-shape right here, as well as tape all around the edges as well. So this thing is really secure in place, and because of that it's actually very hard to get out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a hairdryer all along the back as well as on the front of it, all across the sides as well as in that E-shape. Now my hairdryer won't work in this room, it'll actually trip a connection, and so because of that I have to go into the bathroom to do that. I live in an old house in Hawaii. So I'm going to do all of that off camera. And I would keep the hairdryer about an inch away from the surface as I'm going back and forth. So it sounds a little awkward, but I'm going to go run to the bathroom and I'll be right back. Okay, my device is suitably warm now, so I'm going to go ahead and start taking this screen off. Now there's only one small space to actually be able to push through at the top here. You have a little bit more space on the bottom, but all the same, it's kind of hard to push the screen out from the back. And so at first I tried a tool, it didn't seem to work very well, so then I just tried to manhandle it here, and then I used a guitar clip to just go ahead and work around the edges of it and try to loosen up the adhesive that's around the edges of the screen. And I was kind of hoping to keep the screen intact in case I needed it for some other projects, but as soon as I started pulling it out, I realized I was going to pull this display out in at least two pieces. And so, unfortunately, unless you have a heat gun and like an hour of patience to kind of really take this apart, I would just expect that you're going to lose your original Retroid Pocket 2 screen if you're going to do this upgrade. So once I realized that, I was like, all right, fine, I'm just going to rip this thing out. So I pulled it right out, and then that's the display part. And then the backing itself I also still needed to take out. And so at this point I kind of just didn't really care about the screen anymore and I just went in with my tools. And so I pushed the tweezers in to pop it out a little bit and then I used a metal spudger to just kind of really get in there and pull it out. If you have a plastic spudger I would recommend doing that and maybe taking a little bit of time. But really once you get your fingers wrapped around it it's pretty easy to just pull the rest off. And so here we are. I've gone ahead and pulled off both sides of the display and everything is still intact. However, during the course of using that metal spudger, I accidentally scraped a little bit of the case. And now as you can see here, I have a little bit of a gash at the top of my device. And that's a little bit disappointing, but all the same, I'm probably the only one who's actually going to notice it. And so overall, that was a pretty easy teardown. And unfortunately, this old screen, it's seen better days. But all the same, we got a new one now, so let's install that one. First thing I would recommend doing is just kind of sliding it in one time without the glue or adhesive showing, so that way you can get a feel for what the installation is going to be like. You basically start at the bottom and then leverage it down. And yeah, unfortunately the screen isn't going to cover that gash fully. And so same thing here, we're going to use a tape that's in an E shape, and then we also have some adhesive around the edges. Now by this point my tweezers were kind of royally screwed, and so they're just kind of not working anymore. So I went back to my metal tweezers from my toolkit, and they worked just fine. And so take your time with this part, you just basically want to pull off the adhesive backing for each of these tape strips. Sometimes the tape itself will want to come off, and if that happens, then maybe just try the other side as you're going forward. Either way, you can use your fingernail or some tweezers to pull those out. The E-shaped tape is much easier to pull off, and we're ready to rock. And so, like we practiced before, start at the bottom, make sure you snake through those ribbon cables, and then just kind of pull the ribbon cables until it's flush with the bottom of the case. Once you're good, just go ahead and pop it down and make sure it's all well aligned. 
From there, I would go ahead and just use your thumbs to push along the edges and back of the display. Now, normally when I'm changing out a display, I usually will put a stack of books on top of the screen and leave it for like an hour. But because this has an adhesive backing to it all across the back of it, and it has multiple connection points for the adhesive, I actually don't think that's necessary. I personally think that the Retro Pocket 2 Plus has more tape than it actually needs. Okay, so now let's actually start assembling our Retro Pocket 2 Plus. But first, let's talk about the buttons that I mentioned earlier. As I showed in my review, I think some of the early batches of Retroid Pocket 2 Pluses put a little bit too much paint on their buttons, and so because of that, the buttons were just a little bit too wide for the shell. And so because of that, the sides of the buttons were grinding against my device, and it was super annoying. And that's why I traded these colored buttons out for black buttons. But now I gotta deal with these colored buttons, which are too thick. So first things first, let me try it out in the case, and you know what? The top three buttons are not so bad, but that yellow B button, it is sticking super bad. And even the green Y button has a little bit of issues too. These things are really scraping against the edges. And so I think because the yellow B is so bad, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to use sandpaper along the edges of the button itself. And I'm just using a tiny little piece of sandpaper here, and I'm going to take my time and just kind of go around in a circle and scrape off the edges. I probably spent altogether maybe three or four minutes, and I pulled off most of the paint on each side. So here's a look at the button now when it has about half of the paint scraped off. And let's see if this is making any sort of difference with the case itself. And it does feel a little bit better, but I do have to say that it is not fixed. And so I think we're going to have to take some drastic measures here. I'm going to start sandpapering the inside of the shells. And I'm going to use that same piece of sandpaper, but I'm going to kind of roll it up into a little bit of a tube. And then I'm going to go into each of the buttonholes here and just kind of roll it around and scrape along the edges. I've done this once or twice before with other devices where the buttons were sticking. And unfortunately, if I had known ahead of time that I was going to have to scrape along the insides of the case, I probably would have waited and done this after I added the screen, because I don't want to get any sand on my screen or anything. But I can't really change that now, so let's go ahead and just go for it. And I'm going to scrape along the B buttonhole here and try to make that hole just a little bit wider. And now let's put in the buttons and see if they are any better. And yeah, that's actually quite a bit better. This is almost normal. Actually, now the green one sticks more than the yellow one. So we're on the right track here. I'm actually going to do the same thing again, but this time I'm going to do it on all four buttonholes. Just that way, I'm 100% sure that I'm not going to have to deal with this in the future. Now, I don't want to go too far with the sanding of the holes themselves because I don't want to give the buttons too much wiggle room. And so there's kind of a happy medium here. I would recommend just doing a little bit, then testing, a little bit, and then testing. Overall, I would say I spent a total of four minutes scraping around the edges of the inside of the buttonholes. And yeah, now we're cooking with grease. Every single one of these feel really good. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have scraped the button at all. I should have just gone into the buttonholes themselves, because now the sides of the yellow button are just a little bit wider looking than the others. But it's all good. I'm really happy with how this is turning out. So let's put the rest of the device together. I'm going to add the D-pad now, and then I'm going to add the rubber membrane. This one uses the circle membrane. And then for the face buttons, it uses the one that's kind of in a cross pattern. Each of these have tiny little rubber posts that you will put the small little holes on on the top left and bottom right diagonal ends. It's super easy to put together. It's just kind of intuitive. Next, let's add the home start and select buttons. This is as simple as just putting them right back into place. And then we can add the analog stick. This one also has two little posts at the top, and you can align the analog stick to that. Okay, now let's add the new PCB. Now this one's shaped almost exactly like the other one, so it's actually very easy to put together. But on a side note, what the heck is happening with my rumble motor? It is just like really sloppy here. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm not going to mess with it. Anyway, putting the PCB back in is the same kind of style as pulling it out. You're going to want to go from the bottom up. Just make sure that the Wi-Fi antenna, the little rubber connector for the SD card holder, and then the display ribbon cable are all set in place. Once those are good to go, then go ahead and push everything down and then gently pull out the analog ribbon cable. After that, you're good to go. You just need to make sure your ribbon cables, Wi-Fi antenna, and then the little SD card rubber thing are all in the correct space. Next, let's put back our five PCB screws. Don't worry about those two at the top. Those are for the shoulder buttons. And so now let's start assembling some of our other connectors. For example, the Wi-Fi antenna, which you can just kind of pop into place. And then for the ribbon cable, you want to gently bend it around and then put it into its slot. Take your time with this as well. You really don't want to mess this one up. Just kind of coax it into place and then snap it down once it doesn't go any further. 
you should see a little bit of black coming from the connector. On the analog ribbon cable, it's going to be kind of the same thing. I recommend using tweezers to kind of push it and then use your finger to guide it into the slot. This one doesn't go very far in at all, and you just want to clip it into place. All right, so we're actually doing really good here. Now's a good time to test the buttons, and yeah, these all feel really good. I'm really happy with how this is turning out. The D-pad also feels nice and mushy in a good way. So now let's do the shoulder and trigger buttons. We'll put in the shoulder buttons first, and then add the trigger button assembly. And then this is just going to have two screws that you would put on in each side. Don't tighten these too hard, you just want them snug, not tight. And then do the same thing on the other side. Put in the shoulder button, then the trigger assembly, and then screw them into place. Once that's done, I recommend testing these buttons. Just make sure they're nice and solid feeling, that they're not getting clipped on anything, and that they are making a nice, satisfying clicking sound. Okay, now let's add the speakers. Now the rubber mushy side is the side that's going to face you. The one that's a little bit shiny, that's the one that's going to face out, because that's the actual speaker part. So same thing here, just make sure you push it down into its plastic clip. And it's okay, take your time with this as well. They kind of just go in in only one certain way. But once they sit nice and flush and they're not like bouncing back on you, then they should be good to go. So really, this is what the fully assembled PCB is going to look like. You have your speakers in place, your Wi-Fi connector, display ribbon cable, all the other little things are good to go. So let's go ahead and plug in our battery cable here. Again, it's just a matter of sliding it in very carefully. And we're ready to put the shell back together. What I recommend doing is snapping together the bottom of the case and then working your way up to the top. Again, this is going to be very satisfying to click into place. It may not be super tight, but what I would do here is just kind of squeeze everything and make sure everything is in proper places. I would also push on all the buttons and make sure that they are good to go. Now let's put on our right analog nub and we'll take the screen protector off. And yeah, this gash is kind of starting to bother me, but it's all good. I'm very happy with how this all turned out. Let's turn it on and see how everything's working. Now, because this is the first time that we're starting it up, we're going to have to go through the Retroid Pocket like starter screen. And I've also been working on a starter guide for the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. That'll come out probably uh, this weekend. And so you'll see that here coming soon. And so I'm not really going to walk you through that section right now. But what I will say is that you should test your gamepad. So in that sense, I recommend going into your settings app and then handheld settings and then input and then input control gamepad test. There's actually an app that's just a gamepad tester. You could do that right on the home screen as well, but I wanted to show you where it is in the settings. After that, test out all your buttons and they should be good to go. If they're not, then you're going to need to take it apart and try something else. Anyway, since everything's good to go, I'm more than happy to now put the screws back into the back of the case and also the rubber bumpers. Now, if the bumpers don't go in all the way, then you're probably going to need to pull them out and then tighten the screw just a little bit more so that there's more space. Now, the bumpers have a hole in one side of it. The hole is going to want to go down towards the bottom. Anyway, just kind of keep pushing, and then if it doesn't fit perfectly, then take it out and screw it back in and just kind of keep going. And so, yeah, we're actually done with the video at this point. And so I hope this guide was helpful for you. You know, I just kind of wanted to walk you through the basics of changing out your PCB. Now, the kit actually does come with some written instructions, and there's a really great written guide on the Retro Handhelds website, which I will leave in the video description. All the same, I'm super happy with this new Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. It's pretty cool to have a very rare color like the Fantastic Grape, but with the more powerful chipset of the 2 Plus itself. So be on the lookout for the second half of this video where I go and I make the actual acrylic case for the Retroid Pocket 2 PCB. And that'll give you a standalone console that you can then plug into your TV and play retro games on. And of course, like I mentioned, I'm also going to be doing a Retroid Pocket 2 Plus starter guide. And that'll walk you through how to set up all the emulators and everything else for each of the classic systems. And so if you're not already subscribed, what are you doing? Go ahead and push that button. And then when I do the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus starter guide, you'll have it waiting for you in your notifications. Anyway, that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. And let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.